She's only the second person in the world to have run the seven of the most difficult environments in seven different continents, but the first to do it within seven months. In uh, 2014, uh, she swam, biked, and ran 3,762 miles from Cancun, Mexico to Washington, DC, and set a world record for the longest triathlon ever. Her records, her awards, and her story of how she did this despite a late start and being a mom of two is a remarkable story of human uh, ingenuity, human spirit, human energy, but it all actually pales if you compare that to where she comes from and how she even got here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the e ECLIF Leaders Room. Uh, my name is Rajiv and I'm very pleased to have with us today Norma Bastidas, all the way from uh, Canada. Norma, great to have you with us. Hi, thank you so much. Tell us, uh, uh, st let's start right from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your early years and uh, you know, getting up to where you got to. You know, I, I was born in Mexico, I was born and raised in Mexico, um, and uh, now it's, it's a well-known area because of the cartels. Um, I'm from a place called Culiacan, Sinaloa. So, you know, just a regular upbringing, I guess. Um, the only thing is, uh, from the beginning, um, being raised by a single mother because my father died very, very young. And that kind of, you know, the lack of opportunities, the, the lack of resources, uh, having my mom now a single parent of five, that's what really led me into a life of, you know, incredible hardships, but also, uh, you know, a, a lot of successes just because the opportunities weren't given to me, so I had to find them. So you, you were growing up in the family of five. Yes. And um, uh, how, what, what were the early years like? You know, I, it, it's, you know, like typical to a family in Mexico. I mean, my parents didn't have a lot, but, you know, they, they were caring. Um, and um, my, my father was, a, you know, unfortunately was an alcoholic, but, uh, you know, he had a, a lot of problems. But he also instilled a, a sense of um, that education was important. And I think I have to really talk about that and give him the credit because for a man who was uneducated, my dad did not have an opportunity, opportunities for education. He wanted that for us. And uh, so he made sure that we always had books. So I, you know, now looking back, we were very, very poor. But I mean, the things that they were important and my dad always make sure that even though we didn't have money, that there were books uh, in the house. Uh, I, I think I learned to read at four. You know, my sibling, it was education was, was very, definitely very important. My mom was like any other parent in Mexico, you know, overwhelmed and educated as well. Uh, you know, had to marry young. Both of my parents were 16, 17 when they married. So, I mean, from the start, it wasn't the ideal situation, but I think is uh, what they did give us is the desire to a better life. And that was probably, you know, what made me want to continue fighting for, you know, the opportunities. Um, unfortunately, like, like I said, my dad was an alcoholic and uh, died young, so that really set the tone for a life of, unfortunately, of violence, because once you're introduced to that, you know, I always say that they want, uh, one door opens in violence, and especially when it is a family member, families tend to not deal with it and, and kind of try to cover up. And, and, you know, for us, we didn't get the help that we needed, so it just kind of snowballed into one kind of violence leads to all the types of violence. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you know, you, you went through a lot of difficulty and personal assaults uh, when you were young. Uh, how did that happen and how did you cope with all of that? You know, I, I, it's hard for me to, you know, to really kind of make sense of it because, you know, my life is so different now, right? And I am the same person. Mm -hmm. So it, it's difficult for me to explain to, to, to people that that could happen to somebody like me, that it's now strong in a leader in expeditions and can tackle the most difficult. So how do you go from victim to champion? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like because I am the same person. But it is a lot of the circumstances is it's not being able to talk about violence, um, especially when, when it is uh, something like that that is shameful, it is a violent uh, f a family member. And, and silence breeds violence, you know, and that's why now I speak against all these things to educate because that's the best way to fight it. Uh, unfortunately, it was, you know, a, it was a family member and, uh, you know, it, it escalated from physical violence to sexual violence at a very, very young age. 
unfortunately, the younger that it, that it happens, uh, the boundaries get get interrupted and get broken into. So you you are really not equipped to be able to reinforce balance to to kind of um, you know very uh, being able to kind of reinforce and say don't do, you you can't do that to me you know because your boundaries have been broken so much, you know have, have been trampled on and that probably now looking back is it's what led it to you know one type of violence and, and why it kept happening so many times is because I was not taught the you know I wasn't given the tools to protect myself and when 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 these things were happening to you uh, you did mention that to your family or you kept it all to yourself I, you or? know no I mean it, it gets as a child I mean how do you how do you, a child can comprehend rape you know it's something, you know it is terrific and, and you're dealing with the pain, but a child doesn't have the vocabulary to say I've been raped, you know? So the child doesn't have, I mean I was only 11 and, and for me I, I didn't understand sex, especially because of, you know, culturally in Mexico it's, you know, now it's a bit different, but back then um, sexual uh, education wasn't taught. You know, or something that it wasn't discussed. So it was just kind of one of those things I wasn't able to talk. I mean, I just, uh, especially when you know, if it's a family member, then you have also that that you know, the the family member has some sort of control. It was it was um, it was my grandfather, and, and you're taught you know to respect, and, and it is somebody who is supposed to protect you, and then it now it's telling you that you can't say anything about it. So it is a very difficult thing for a child to go through. Right, because uh, I mean, I didn't know how to, you know, you're taught about stranger, but not about a family member, you know. And when the family member you taught, it's, you know, it's especially when it's, uh, it's a, it's a male, and it is, um, it has a status, and and you watch everybody else um, not standing up to him, and and it has a certain level, then you know, I wasn't able to. You know, just because he told me not to, it, it seems crazy, but that's why I never said anything for a long time. And then your, 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 your escape came years later, or so you thought it was an you escape. Know, it, it, unfortunately, it's every single time I tried to escape one, you know, one type of violence, I ended up encountering another because the opportunities weren't there. You know, I, I wasn't able to just kind of say, well, I'm just going to uh, go to the police and, and find help. Because, um, you know, there's nobody you can turn to. Family are all kind of, you know, trying to protect the secret. So yeah. when you ask, even the when, stigma, yeah. even when you are asking for help, they just simply say, let's just not talk about it and you can't tell anybody else. And then, um, so what I do is um, I try to leave home. You know, when I was old enough, I left home, but then unfortunately I, I ended up being kidnapped in Mexico City. So, uh, you know, it, it just, because I didn't take the opportunity wasn't taken in, in the highest, you know, standards. It was just, you know, it's not like I got a great job offer. It was just simply trying, you know, calling my brother that had moved out. And, and I said, I, you know, can I come and live with you? And, and I was unsupervised when I was 17. And it just happened that randomly I was, you know, grabbed on a bus stop and thrown into a car and kidnapped for the first time. I was 17, 18 around that time. So, you know, being from province and, and like I said, I wasn't, you know, able to speak against these bluntly to say, why are you doing this to me? I just simply, every single time something like that happened or somebody uh, exercised their authority, I folded. That was my initial reaction because even when I was brave enough as a child to say this happened to me, I was blamed and I was shamed. So every single time anything that happened, I just kept blaming myself, you know, because I found myself, you know, in, in the same situation. So, um, and, you know, same thing. So after, uh, fortunately for me, I managed to escape um, about 24 hours after they had me in, in a house. I managed to um, convince somebody who came into the house before I was sold to help me out, and he did. And uh, so now my role was to leave, you know, my understanding of like, okay, it's not only home, it's Mexico. So what I did is I accepted a job offer to go to Japan. And the same thing, it was, I put myself in a vulnerable position um, just because I, I mean, I needed to continue working because I had to help my family. 
my mom had no money. And I was, at that point, the, the highest earner in my family, even though I was only 19 years old and I was the youngest. I was uh, the one with the most potential in, in our home. And uh, so I did, and I found myself in the same situation that I tried to escape, and it was not being able to understand the kidnapping and human trafficking happens in, in, in a different forms. You know, I always thought it was like in the movies, masked man with a trench coat, mm -hmm. not a nice person that you know from your neighborhood that, you know, she seems friendly and, and, and ask you to, you know, she says, hey, you know, you, you are a model, you should go to Japan. And it happens so subtle and so unscary that you let your guards down. And I now understand the grooming process also, which is enables you to be controlled, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is they become your best friends, they become your saviors, they're giving you what you need, which is, oh, you, you need to leave Mexico. Japan is different, it's such a safe country, and you have lots of opportunity. And then you do, and they're taking you, and so they, 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 pray, they pretend they're protectors, and they prey on vulnerabilities. And then that's when then once they start chipping away at your confidence by taking your passport, by isolating you, not understanding their language and all that, that's when the pressure starts and you're unable to really help yourself because by this time, you consented to so many things. And now, that's how I know that, that that's how predators operate. You know, they make you do something. Then later, you know, you, you have a hard time going to the police because you either lie or you consented to something, you know? And then they make it difficult for you. Make it very difficult. I accepted knowing that it was, uh, accepted a, a, a working a visa and knowing that it wasn't the type of visa that I needed, they said, don't worry about it. You're not an entertainer. You're a model, but we're going to give you. So I can go to the police because now I entered the country legally under a different visa that I needed. So I'm in trouble. So, I mean, it seems simple now. Yeah. But well, now... Those are the kind know, of things they do. Yes, that's, that's how it, it happens. And when did you realize, uh, how long into your stay in Japan did you realize that things were not what they were supposed to be, what they were promised? Um, it was, I would say, three, four months. Oh, so for the first three, four months you didn't realize? Well, I, I, I knew it wasn't, but I, I didn't really end up being in the trouble that so I ended up. you didn't understand up. the extent of what they were going exactly. to, the plans they had Exactly. I ended up working at a bar, wearing a bikini, for example. It is not what I consented. And it was absolutely terrifying for somebody like me. I was 19 and, and you know, being parade with little clothing on those and, and talking and being spoken in a, in a different manner. I mean, those are things that I did, but I kind of pushed back. And, and, you know, especially as a woman, especially of certain cultures, you learn mm -hmm. that, you know, men have control over you. You're young and if you want something, so there's somehow an exchange that it is undignifying for, but if, you know, we place such a value on certain women, they say, well, you know, you're poor, and if you want money, this is what you have to do. And it's a terrible thing, terrible, terrible, terrible thing, because, you know, you accept it. And I know that it happens all over the world. The women, especially in certain areas that, you know, especially if you don't have money or if you want to be a, an actress, you know, it's that understanding. Uh, but it wasn't until the pressure started to, you know, to be somebody's, um, bought by somebody, it didn't happen for three months. Um, it was just simply, and now, I didn't know it was called human trafficking. Back then, there was no such a thing. You know, there was no law against it. I signed a contract, and I, there was a pressure for me to have sex with somebody. I had absolutely no way of going anywhere for help. It became a law t 2002. We're talking about 1986, 1987. And then how did you manage to get out of that? Yeah, I just simply pay my debt. It was a long time for me, nine, 10 months, something like that. Um, I had nowhere to go. So I just simply did what they wanted me to do. And um, that's the case for most victims. 
there's no such a thing as like the movie The Taken where ne Liam Neeson comes to your rescue, you know. There's no such a thing. A lot of um, women there find themselves in those situations, have to find a way out. So without opportunities, um, you know, I, 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 the only reason why it ended is because I was able not to only to pay my debt, but a school offered to give me a student visa, a legal way to stay in the country, legal. So I had, I could ask for, for help legally. So, um, so what I did is um, when I was working at a bar, they, they were giving tips. So I, I remember somebody saying that there was, um, they, had, they were there in the country as a student. So I went to their school and started paying for classes. And um, they knew, they knew from the moment that I, uh, that I walked in that there was something. That, that I found myself in a situation that I didn't want to be in. They said, you know what, we can give you a student visa. Yeah. And then they, that became the That kindness, for that greatness. kindness of somebody who was able not question, they didn't ask me, are you, sh you know, they didn't treat me like I was garbage because that's from the beginning. I mean, we, I mean, we treat women like, you know, we put value on their virginity so much that, you know, I had to suffer violence. And I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're just talking about years and years, and, and I'm just talking in general. I mean, even in, at school, when they found out that I had been kidnapped in, in, um, in Mexico City and I came back, all my classmates, I mean, all of a sudden, I was drugged and raped several times just because I was not a virgin anymore. So for them, their value, I mean, I had no value. So I've been treated like that so many times with people that I knew that I trusted, that when I in, went to Japan, by being treated like that, by somebody that I didn't know, it's terrible. But, you know, and, and then I had these teachers and these uh, people that had a international Japanese school there that they saw the value, they, they just saw past that. They just simply said, if you don't wanna be there, you don't have to. We can give you a student visa, we can sponsor you. And that's how it happened. And so fast forward now a little bit to, you then from there went to Canada, uh, and then, how did you start running? How did this life start? I mean, it, it really, you know, and I think that the, it is incredible how, I mean, we're talking about so many years ago in, in my life, how it was, it was so different that when I actually start talking about these, most people that know me now had absolutely no idea. And I think that's my biggest success and that's the biggest misconception, right? That we have that victims are damaged and, and vulnerable and weak. and and. It, it, my life was completely different, and I went back to the same thing. When I went to Canada, I became a single parent very, very soon. I divorced, and I, I had two young boys, a three-year-old and a baby when I became so a single So you went back to Canada, you did get married? I did, I married a Canadian. That's how I ended, I ended up going to Canada. Uh -huh. And um, same thing, I kept had, suffering violence in Japan. Even after leaving the club, they still, you know, that's what mafia does. You know, you, you never really escape. So I ended up marrying a Canadian and moved to Canada. Divorced. Uh, so you met him in uh, I Japan? I met him in Japan. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. So, right. and, and I wanted to leave. Like I said, it's always, but fortunately for me, Canada was a bit, it was very different. Even though my marriage didn't last, um, you know, I was able to find opportunities. I went back to school, earned a um, business administration diploma. I entered the workforce. I was uh, being very, very, within three years. You know, I was um, climbing the ranks and I was uh, finishing a Bachelor of Management as well. I was on full porns to make sure that, you know, I was going to take care of my kids. And uh, they weren't going to suffer what we suffer as kids, having a mom who couldn't work. I was going to provide for my children and they never had to find themselves in a, in a vulnerable situation. Um, fortunately for me, uh, a few years into it, my um, uh, you know, just as I was waiting for a promotion as a manager, uh, my son, my oldest son, became, uh, was diagnosed with something that's called Conrad dystrophy mm -hmm. and started to go blind. That just absolutely changed everything, everything. I lost my job. I couldn't really get out of bed. I had a very hard time for many reasons. It just because the first person to ever rape me was a blind relative that I had to look after. And now my son was going blind. It was just a bit too much for anybody. And it just kind of one of those things that, even though I, I never really wanted to talk about it, now I couldn't deny. I mean, I, I, even now I, I have a hard time because I always say that 
I, I sometimes want the lies that I said that never happened to me to be true. You know, once I decided that I was gonna, I needed to confront what happened to me, all of it, if I was able to help my son. I couldn't just half bury, I couldn't do what my family did, which is deny, not talk about it. So I had to really, really face it. But I couldn't just stand up and talk about it. So what I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't sleep and um, I needed to be there for my son. So I just went for a run one day, you know, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. My mom came from Mexico to help me out. And I just didn't want her to help me, to hear me crying, so I just went for a run. And, uh, and that just kind of happened, that the difference between handling the trauma in the past with, it, with drinking was that I found myself in a bigger hole. Running, on the other hand, and make me clear my head, I felt better. Every single time I came from a, from a run, I was like 6 a.m. waking up everybody, and I felt better. I felt like... You know, it, it was just that uh, it, it just gave me a purpose. You know, I could lace up and go for a run and come back, and I was like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna apply for another job, and so that's how it happened. It, 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 it was so stressful because my son, you know, had to help him, and, and he went back to school, and you know, I had to kind of teach him how to live differently because now he was a child with a disability that needed accommodations, and uh, so I, it was so much stress that I just kept running. Within six months, um, somebody noticed that um, my best friend noticed that I was, you know, running incredible, and I've never really. I was 38, almost 39, and um, and she was like, "Wow, you know, you really are running incredible." And she just kind of on a dare said, um, "You know, maybe you should try to qualify for Boston." It's a long shot, she said. You know, most people have to try for years, and that's all I needed. I needed something that I could control. I couldn't control so many things that were happening in my life, you know but I could control that. I, and I, it gave me something to look forward and something that I could control. So I did, I built my schedule and I did, and I did. I qualified for Boston within eight months. I ran my first ultra marathon, 125 kilometer race. Uh, and it just kind of happened like that. It just, you know, I just went full on doing ultra races. How I connected is because I, I was going online talking about my training because there was people gonna donate for me uh, for one of my races and I just ended up pouring my soul. And I just kind of, you know, it was about talking about all these things. So I, I made, you know, my weakness, my strength. Instead of saying this is something that I should be ashamed, now I'm going to turn it around because I'm tired of carrying this shame. I'm gonna turn it around and I'm gonna be proud of it. And that's what I did. I, and, but what happened is now people weren't afraid to ask me about how is he doing because they saw that I was trying to, you know, I was doing something positive about it. And that's how the, the activism in the sports connected. And that was my first time that I realized that people really connected to the story better when I gave them something that they could look, you know, kind of talk about a difficult topic like my son gone blind and a, a, a raise, because instead of, uh, I was thinking about maybe $200 uh, for the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, I ended up collecting 3500 And that's when I went, bingo, this is it. This is how people are going to listen to my message. You know, they came for one thing, and I also educated them. So you gave yourself a purpose. I did. And that gave you the energy. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. And so, you know, at 39, when you start preparing for these kinds of races, and then we haven't even come to your uh, triathlon yet, uh, there must have been times when you felt like giving up. Because what couldn't have been easy at 39 and 40 to train yourself? What did you do to keep going? You know, the beauty of finding yourself a at the bottom is you have nothing to lose. I had absolutely nothing to lose. So I just went and, and didn't focus on anything. I mean, there were times I mean, the giving up part happened long before. You know, like when I found myself almost killed at 24 in Japan, that I had left my life behind and I had bought my passport and I was in, in um, you know, I was working as a, I spoke full, fluent Japanese and I was working translating movies and then, you know, somebody put something on my drink and I woke up completely unconscious and disfigured. And, 
I just felt the heaviness, I thought, you know, because they just wanted me to remind me that I couldn't escape my past, that it was always going to come back. They just wanted revenge. That's giving up. That's the moment when I thought, I am so tired. Race is on the other hand. I'm, I get tired, but I don't feel like quitting. You know, it's a difference between pain and suffering. Pain is a wonderful thing because, because it, it, it's tied to a success, to a goal. Pain is sometimes what it takes to accomplish something great. University, I mean, if you want to be a doctor, you're going to spend lots of, you know, painful nights studying or, you know. So there's a difference between pain and suffering. So once you understand both, one is tolerable. You just have to help manage. You just have to understand your body really well. You have to have a strategy plan. I am so glad I'm not in the suffering stage anymore. So that's why I can, I can take the goals. But, but the, the catalyst to do something became your son's um, uh, eye condition. But you had been in difficult situations before, as we were just talking about. Um, but it took the situation with your son yes. that, that became the turning point, not all the things that terrible things that happened no, to you. My son, I, and it was the desire, this was greater than myself. And that's what I do now. This is the purpose. Once I went, this is for somebody else, not for me. You know? So even in a situation that kind of situations that you found yourself in, uh, what I'm hearing is that the purpose, once it's greater than yourself, that's when it gets exactly. you. Exactly. And that's why everything I do is tied up to, you know, not to myself. And I mean, I could do these things and not be public, and it's fine. But once I get, uh, uh, you know, uh, an organization or, a, or talking about human trafficking, like, for example, the, the world record triathlon was following the human trafficking route, and I have survivors telling the story as I'm crossing all these areas. I mean, I had to swim 122 miles, and I couldn't swim before that. I had to learn to swim to mm. break the record. But because I encountered such a um, so lack of empathy to tell this story, a lot of people didn't want to talk about human trafficking. They were like, well, we feel bad, but this is ugly. We just talk about, I mean, let's talk about sport. And that kind of made me angry, as if, you know, we're so willing to give medals to people who do. And I mean, I think they do, but but also people that survive incredible odds. You know, those are the people that we also be celebrating. So it was their inability to want to talk about that, that they wanted to talk, and that's why I just went bigger. I just said, okay, let's do a, a triathlon, and I'm gonna learn to swim, and I almost tripled the record. Because, I mean, the more resistance and the more people that I wanted to help, the better I, I, I get. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do these things for myself. And so, uh, to conclude, what's next for you? What do you want to spend the next 10 years of your life doing? <laughs> well, I mean, there's so many things. Uh, I just, you know, I, I really want to continue, you know, finding things that scare me. You know, like going towards, that's where growth happens. You know, if I, every time I'm, I'm trying to, and, and I'm always trying to be in tune in where the opportunities lie, not to be so busy just, just with, you know, with the goals, but, uh, and I listen, and, and every time I find my, myself in a situation that I just, I cannot possibly comprehend how I'm gonna do it, that's what I do, that's where I go. Every single time I feel this is impossible, then that's, I put everything on the side. That's, and that gets you going. It, that that's where going. I wanna that's go. Going. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, so openly and so intimately what, you're, what, you, what you've gone through. And I, uh, I commend you for, uh, for, for doing that because not only is that an inspiration for a lot of people, uh, I hope everybody that's listening and watching today, uh, there's so many lessons that you can get out of this. Uh, but the one that's, that remains with me is once the purpose that you define for yourself is greater than yourself, then absolutely nothing is impossible. Uh, so with that, Norma, thank you very much. It was thank great you. to have you with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.